Welcome back to the GHT Overland Podcast. This is part two of our interview with Misha from the Netherlands. From border crossings, navigation, to more specific vehicle information. Let's get started. We did those borders just to prepare for difficult borders. Okay. And it turns out when we got to Africa that we had no difficult borders at all. Uh, they usually take about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh and uh, it's just filling out paperwork. Uh, you're standing in line for a little bit. Sometimes you have to pay charges. Uh, sometimes the charges are a bit of a surprise. But uh, in Africa, at least, everybody speaks English. Um, so you get along with people just fine. And we never, ever use a fixer or an agent or someone to help us out. Uh, okay. You just you – know, the people will point you in the right directions. They'll try to help you. They're always genu- uh, genuinely happy to see you, and there's always smiles and people trying to help you. So uh, we didn't really need uh, agents. Okay. Uh, I think the big takeaway there is making sure that you've got your paperwork in order properly and double checking all that and just being patient oh yeah definitely be patient be polite and have everything in order there's so much information available online out there today that uh, you can be prepared for any border <clears throat> but if you say in you know if you've got a, a, a fixed journey that you're, you're that you're concentrating on that you know you're going to stay in one area and that area can be as big as like eastern africa for all i know uh, but then you know for those countries you have to have those documents and they're pretty much all the same so as long as you have that in order and you have patience, you'll get there no problem, and it won't take so much time. Good. Hey, do you travel with any animals at all? Do you have a dog or a cat that you take with you? Well, my wife travels with an animal, and you're talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> Did she, you didn't require any extra licensing? <laughs> no, just lots of experience Very and good. patience. But uh, no, no, we don't have any animals, animals with us. Okay. Do you travel with any other vehicles or – I don't think you guys use a trailer, do you? Uh, no, we don't have a trailer. Uh, the truck is big, big enough so that we have everything with us. Uh, so the only thing we have with us is the extra motorcycle on the back uh, and two bicycles inside. Um, okay. So that's Did about that it. motorcycle ever cause any issues? I'm probably thinking not, but border crossings for licensing or anything? Well, the, the biggest problem we had with the motorcycle was shipping it from the Netherlands uh, to South Africa. Okay. Uh, we shipped a truck with the motorcycle to South Africa, and on the day of departure, uh, the, the customs officer calls me up and he said that the motorcycle has to come off. And uh, so I had to rush over to the harbor to, to remove it because apparently, for some reason, motorcycles are not allowed on that vessel, that particular vessel that oh, day okay so uh, we had to ship it separately create it and uh, it uh, arrived in africa three weeks after we did so uh, that was the only problem we had really um an interesting bit of thing uh, an in- interesting thing we had on the way was that when we crossed from africa into botswana and into zambia we tried to get the motorcycle insured uh, in South Africa, you don't need insurance for your car because insurance is covered in the fuel price. So that's uh, an interesting construction. Okay. But uh, And we had uh, complete world coverage insurance for our truck. So we just needed local insurance for the motorcycle. So we got into Botswana and uh, we got the truck cleared into the country. And then I said, but I also need the motorcycle cleared uh, into the country for insurance. But he says, no, no, you cannot do this because the motorcycle is currently uh, not on the road. It is on the truck, so you cannot insure this vehicle. And I thought it was completely out of his mind. But then at the next border crossing, they told us the exact same thing. So it ended up, uh, we got to, finally, when we got to Zambia, we were able to insure the motorcycle. And by that time, we'd been on the road for like three months already, uh, apparently uninsured. But, you know. Not being able to insure is fine as long as you don't crash. Yeah, true. So on any specific safety planning that you do or tips you can provide our listeners on safety and security? Yeah, that was a big question. Every time we told somebody uh, that we're going to Africa or any other strange country, um, first thing that people ask is, isn't that dangerous? And yep. um 
yeah. Well, it isn't. Uh, if, as long as you use common sense, uh, if you you know inform yourself, if you talk to people on the way, if you uh, visit uh, websites uh, uh, like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that will tell you what's going on in the country. Um, but especially talking to other people that have just been there, uh, you get the, the right information about whether it's safe or not. And for the rest, it's common sense. If you if you park somewhere and there's people running around waving machetes, that's probably not the place you want to spend the night. So you move on a couple of miles. Um, we didn't have that happen, by the way. But it's it, it is all just you know uh, common sense. Yeah, and, uh, it's 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 a lot less dangerous than uh, than the media will have you believe. Uh, we went to Sudan, and uh, Sudan is, I think, apparently on uh, uh, your president's blacklist. Um, but it turns out they were the most friendly people we, uh, we, we'd like ever met and they'd come and come up to you and talk to you and you'd be all on your guard because they're trying to rip me off or whatever. Uh, sure. but no, they just want to practice their English and they want to share a cup of coffee or tea with you and they want to dance with you and, and sing with you and just be happy. It is completely amazing. It blew us away. And beforehand people told us that, uh, Sudan was one of the most amazing countries they'd been to when I never really believed them but it turns out to be amazing uh and all this hype about how dangerous it is well maybe it is but not the places we've been to okay. so and safety wise we didn't carry any guns because first of all in, in in europe it's really difficult to get guns uh i carried a, a machete which turns out to be good just for cutting whatever it was in the way we never needed it for security or safety <laughs> Okay. And also, security is not much. Well, it's less of an issue because I'm six foot six and tend to scare people off. So that's you know. <laughs> so that helps, right? <laughs> that helps definitely. That's terrific. So, what are some tips you have for safe money management? Um, don't carry too much cash for starters. Um, but you have to prepare yourself. Uh, we found out that. The most amount of money you can get from an ATM is 40 bills of whatever denomination they have. And okay. if you if you go to an ATM in America, that would mean that, you know, you'd be able theoretically to get 40 $100 bills, which is quite a bit of money. Uh, but, of course, the banks only allow you so much. But when you get to a country like Malawi, uh, the biggest denomination is worth about – half a dollar I think so okay. if you get 40 bills of those you got like 40 or 50 dollars that's it or you know 20 or 30 dollars so you have to do several withdrawals because we have like a, a 800 liter tank which is over 200 gallons of diesel and if you want to fill up you can't pay with a credit card you have to pay cash so you have to start stocking up cash just before you start gassing up uh, a couple of days ahead of time so you have to think about this and make sure you have enough so for that we had uh, several ATM cards we had a couple of credit cards we had a, a Visa card and a MasterCard uh, in some countries they prefer the one and in others they prefer the other and also you know if one gets stolen blocked or you know you have problems with the card you have enough spares so on currency, how are you managing currency as you're changing, going from one country to another? Has that ever been a challenge for you, or do you have a specific uh, way of going about that? Yeah, uh, in Africa, at most borders, there's uh, all kinds of ways to change money, uh, some legal, uh, some less. Uh, and the block market exchange is really nice because you get three or four times more than uh, what you're supposed to be getting. Uh, that sounds really good, but when you leave the country, you always have a bit of money left, and you have to change that back, and then you get ripped off again. So at the end of the day, it all evens out. Um, after a few countries, after like the first six or seven countries, we had all kinds of leftovers money-wise. But then you meet other, people's, uh, other people going the other way. So you kind of you know what kind of money do you have left, and what do we have left? So you kind of make your own exchange. So that usually works out. Do either of you work during your traveling? And if not, how do you save up for your trips? Uh, no, we wanted to. Uh, we kind of thought actually about finding a place even to stay. But uh, no, we both quit our jobs just to be able to do this. We saved up ahead of time. So in that case, you have to save up like a year's salary plus a margin. Uh, so we didn't have to work. Uh, and we ended up actually not working at all on the way. 
get into navigation and communication. You touched on that a little bit. I have a background in search and rescue, so I'm hyper-focused on these two things um, for all the reasons that search and rescue exist. What is your method of navigation um, today, or what do you presume that it would be on your next trip um, to make sure you know where you are and how to get to your next spot? Yeah, uh, navigation today is uh, is really easy. There's a, a few apps out there for phones and tablets, and um, anywhere in the world in the world you can find a phone or tablet, so you don't have to bring like two or three backups. So for navigation, I use uh, uh, OSM AND and Maps uh, which are uh, okay. uh, free navigation apps for iOS and Android, I think, or at least for Android. Um, but also, I go back to uh, Garmin uh, software, not Garmin hardware. Uh, for Garmin software, you can install on a PC and you can add any map to it. Um, that you know, like that, you, you always know where you are. Um, the more interesting bit is to know where you're going, and that's where you get your waypoints. And there's communities out out there online that'll share waypoints, and uh, that's a great source of information. Um, and as a last backup, we had a satellite phone with us uh, that will give us our position as well, but would also be an emergency communication device just in case you're out of cell phone coverage. But it turns out there's cell phone coverage about uh, for pretty much the entire continent, so that turns out to, to be a bit superfluous. And were you having to get like a SIM card at each um, at different countries as you go in? Yeah, that's what we'll do next time. Uh, for this trip, okay. we uh, use a company called WorldSIM. That have, they have like one SIM card for the entire world. Uh, but it turns out that it's uh, it's a bit of a hassle to uh, to use it. Uh, it's a complicated calling process, and the calling quality is is really really bad uh, because all calls are routed uh, through England for some reason. So if I'm in Kenya and I'm calling someone. You know, just in the next village, that call has to be routed via satellite uh, to England and then back again to Kenya. So you have huge delays. Um, and also they have uh, contracts with the cheapest suppliers, uh, cell phone suppliers, network suppliers in the country. So that's that was a bad idea. So what I will do next time is uh, get a SIM card at each border because at every border they sell SIM cards and they're really cheap. Uh, and the good thing about that one is you get a data plan uh, uh, along with it, so you know you can be online with it as well. How flexible do you guys stay with your planned route, or do you make plans one day at a time? Uh, um, well, we'd, we'd like to think we're really flexible uh, right up until the point that we plan out every single step. Um, we kind of get a, a general idea of where we want to go. But then when you get to the country, uh, you find out that you get like a 30 or a 60-day visa. And then you really have to make a plan um, to, 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 to have something to follow that you make sure that, you're, uh, that you leave the country uh, before your visa expires. So you kind of have to, or we thought we kind of had to make a bit more of a plan than we originally wanted to. Um, but I find out that um, probably for next time we try to be a lot more flexible and plan a lot less. But it's kind of in our nature, so we'll probably end up having to plan too much anyway. <laughs> you sound like me. <laughs> yeah. So your backup plan, is that, the, is that the satellite phone? So if you get stuck or lost or just something goes south on you? Yeah, that's one of the backup plans. We're, we, we we both have an IT department, so we're like huge on backup. So everything that we do has at least you know two or three alternatives. Uh, backup number one was the motorcycle. If we're stuck in the middle of nowhere, grab the motorcycle and go. Um, but if we'd really be stuck, yeah, that's why we uh, that's why we got the satellite phone. Um, so we got that and ended up not having to use it whatsoever because there's always coverage and there were no problems. That's good. On communication, what do you use? Uh, is it just a cell phone? Do you use a ham radio or a CB? No, we just had a, a cell phone. Um, ham radios we've never gotten into. Uh, and in Africa, I don't think it's really widely used. Uh, so that was no was no, 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 no issue or option for us. So just a cell phone, yeah. 
Now, back on your vehicle, obviously a reliable vehicle is pretty important. It sounded like yours was uh, top-notch. What is um, your pre-trip planning process so that you're confident in your vehicle before you leave home? Yeah, that was quite an issue um, because the, the the truck is really reliable because uh, because it was just built that way. Um, but it took us a couple of trips uh, just to have faith in it, uh, just to have, have it not break down, um, uh, no problems or something. Uh, when we were at the point that we've done a bunch of trips uh, that we knew the truck was going to be okay, then we were confident enough to go on a long journey. Uh, and when you're on the road, um, you know, just before you leave, you just change everything you can uh, fluid-wise and you make sure that the starter engine is okay and that you know, all the engine accessories are uh, uh, everything that you can replace, you replace because, you know, uh, Murphy's Law is out there in the jungle as well. So, you know, your starter engine will break down whenever there's no one around. So, yep. yeah. So we, we replaced everything we could uh, that was vaguely necessary. Uh, and on the road, you just all you can do is is is, is maintain it, um, uh, replace your fluids whenever you can. And uh, we had at one point we found out that our axle, um, uh, what do you call it, axle fluid oil uh, was too European. Uh, it was geared for cold temperatures. And we're out there driving in, uh, in in the heat, and all of a sudden the car smells like the brakes are on fire. Uh, turns out it was the axle grease that was just too thin. So we go to this local shop, and they uh, took out the really expensive European oil and put in the cheapest gunk you can find. And up to this day, it's still in there because it works just that fine. That worked great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. How do you plan for those road repairs? Uh, like what tools and spare parts are you carrying? Oh, quite a bunch. Um, we have so much space that we can carry pretty much anything we like. So um, I have equipment with me just to change the tires because changing tires on a truck is a bit different than on a car. Uh, on this truck, especially because uh, the wheels stay on and you just remove the tires. They're uh, special rims and you require some special tools for it. Uh, you have a couple of extra jacks. And for the rest, you just carry everything that you can think of, like uh, fluids and filters and rubbers and rings and hoses and, and all kinds of crates full of stuff, just general stuff. And whenever something would break down, I'd start rummaging through it and figure out, you know, do I carry this or not? Uh, one of the fun things we had with us was a, was a spare flexible uh, exhaust pipe that we ended up having to use even. So that was uh, that was a good thing. Um, so if you have a breakdown on the road, you're not able to fix it, like the gear oil that you had, yeah. how do you um, either find the parts, or in this case, you obviously got back to a shop. Any advice you have on selecting a repair shop? Uh, well, for us, it was that we had to have a, a truck that was specialized in uh, in, in big trucks. And uh, we got this truck because this, this series of trucks, of Mercedes trucks, is very popular uh, in Africa, Asia, and South America. It's still being used there, even though it's 30 years old. And so the the, 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 the knowledge at the, at the local shops about this truck is still there. Um, so what we did is before we got to a country, we'd go online and find all Mercedes dealers or shops that uh, would be in our general direction and have a, a small database uh, of those locations. So whenever we did get in trouble, we'd able to call, we, we would be able to call them or swing by to have uh, to have repairs done. But you know, it turns out the only repair we did was uh, the exhaust and the, and the gear fluid, and that's about it. Okay. Do you carry one spare tire or two? No, we carry two. Just did you ever have to use both? Uh, nope, nope. Uh, we, <laughs> we we just had one flat tire on the road, and that was because someone in Ethiopia we suspect uh, put out a bolt uh, in front of our car uh, just before we left, so we drove into that oh. bolt. Um, and I didn't change the tire; I just repaired it. 
what we did do, however, because uh, our rear tires were overloaded a bit and they were starting to wear unevenly, that when we got to uh, Tanzania, I think, we rotated the tires uh, and put the spare tires on uh, on the back and put the back tires back on the spares. So they weren't flat, but we just rotated them just to be, you know, be able to make it home. So that was a good thing. We had to, both of them with us, but we didn't need them for flat tire replacement or something. When you did that tire rotation, did you do that, or did you take it to a shop to have it done? Yeah, I wanted to do it, but I uh, uh, got about halfway on the first tire, and uh, it was completely stuck. So we took it to a shop in uh, Dar es Salaam, which was really exciting because it was really ultimately African. So I told this guy to change the tires in a certain order, and you know, being the guy that he was, he decided to completely ignore me uh, and uh, go his own way. So... Um, we came back after an hour, and our truck is just sitting up on four little tiny jacks, completely unstable and totally dangerous, with all four wheels removed, and I was completely freaking out. But um, he got lucky. The, the, he didn't fall off the jacks, and he replaced them. Wow. Now, I don't know if you mentioned it. How much fuel are you able to carry? Uh, 800 liters, which carries That's about, right. you know, I don't know how many gallons is that, a little bit over 200 gallons, I think. And how far does that take you? Uh, that takes us about 2,500 kilometers, which is about 1,500 miles. Um, but that's kind of, you know, the range that we have on paper because um, when we travel, we always start thinking about filling up when it's a quarter empty. Uh, just because you don't know how okay. long it's going to be before you find a decent fuel station. And also, we've had a couple of uh, fuel stations that we pulled up on and we wanted to, uh, to fill up and said, oh, so sorry, no diesel today. And it turns out the oh, entire okay. region didn't have any diesel today. So, yeah, we, we kind of fill up early. Also, when you fill up early, it kind of helps you out that uh, you don't have to carry too much cash for that time. So if you ever get nervous on fuel, how are you calculating what you've got left and how far that can take you? Uh, well, I don't really calculate because just because of the, the the policy of fueling up early, you don't really care if you got uh, you know. By the time we start fueling up, we still have at least a thousand miles of range, um, and it's happened once I think that we were unable to find fuel for a couple of days, so we were down to only about three hundred miles of range. But you know, three hundred miles of range is still a ridiculously long distance. Um, so that was – it wasn't – no, we never calculated. We just kind of winged it uh, and had really comfortable margins. Remind me how much fresh water you're able to carry. Uh, 500 liters. Okay. And then what is – you had mentioned a little bit. Can you go in a little detail on what your purification methods are? Um, so, okay, we have 500 liters of clean water, 140 liters of gray water, and uh, 100 liters of black water. Okay. We fill the main tanks uh, direct, directly with uh, – we can, we can fill the main tanks two, way, two ways. Uh, one is uh, directly straight into the tank with no filters, so that's if you know the water is going to be really clean. Uh, if it's not, it passes through a sediment filter. Uh, then when we uh, use the water, when we go tap the water, uh, it goes to another sediment filter and then to a, an active coal filter and a UV filter. Uh, so by the time it gets to the faucet, it's completely clean to drink. Uh, every now and then we put in silver nitrate in the tanks just to kill any possible bacteria that might be in there. So uh, that way we have uh, potable water all the time. Also what we did is... Uh, we use shower water, so the gray water, we use, the, we use that to flush the toilet so that you don't have to use clean drinking water to flush your toilet. So that okay, was kind you're of able to, how were you able to set up the, the plumbing to do that? Was that something that you just did? or? Uh, well, I would really love to take credit, but uh, we bought the truck secondhand and it was built this way. Okay, somebody else had figured that out. So yeah. um, any tips or thoughts on managing waste as an overlander? Um, well, what we did is our toilet was, a, um, I think you call it a pulverizer. Uh, so yeah. it goes into a, it pulverizes into a, into a black water tank. So that's just pure uh, manure. It's it's one hundred percent natural. So whenever we are uh, we are in a campsite, we will use the campsite facilities to dump it. Okay. But uh, if you're if you're way out bush and there's nobody around, you'll have to dump it somewhere. And since there's no chemicals in it, you can just dump it in nature. 
Okay. And on your electrical system, can you give us just a real quick glimpse into how that was set up and maybe why you set it up the way you did? Yeah, it was uh, it was a really simple setup. It had uh, one solar panel, uh, 185 watts, 24 volts, um, because it's a truck. Everything is 24 volts apparently. Uh, so that one panel uh, was enough to charge our batteries. We had two huge uh, household truck batteries. I think they were like 230 amp hours, um, and that was enough for the for the lighting, for charging phones and laptops, uh, and and to keep the fridge going, uh, whatever. Uh, we had an inverter, uh, a small one. I think it was like 500 watts or something uh, because we don't really need alternating current, but just in case it's there. Okay. Uh, so it's a simple setup, but it's sufficient. Okay. And on heat and AC, what are you using for both uh, the back of the unit, uh, the living quarters and the cab? So for heat, AC, is it a separate system? And I know you've got heat up in the... The front cab, do you have a separate system for AC? Uh, well, we uh, only had a- a- AC in the front cab, in the, in the driver's part, just uh, the, the normal truck's air conditioning, because uh, we decided we wouldn't want to be in a living area with air conditioning because you'd be running in and out of the heat all day. You know, your doors are open, you're going in and out all day. We figured, you know, you better just get used to the heat. And turns out we did get used to the heat. Um that also has some downsides because we've been back for a while now, but uh, I'm still used to the heat, and I really hate the cold temperatures here now. Um, as far as heating is concerned, uh, the, the the living area had a uh, Vebasto heater. Uh, I think it's a, a Scandinavian product. Uh, that's both for hot air heating and uh, for, for, for quick heat, uh, but also for water heating for the radiators. Uh, and actually, we don't even have water in the heating circuit. We have uh, coolant fluid, so we don't have to drain that in winter. Uh, and the same unit also heats for the shower and for the kitchen. So it's one unit that does the the, 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 the climate heating and the, and the water heating. So it's a, it's a comfortable setup. It runs off diesel. It's uh, really efficient and uh the uh, only thing it could be is a bit more quiet because it makes quite a bit of noise when it takes off. Okay, very good. So, Misha, we went through a lot of really good information. And I really appreciate you going through some of those things in some really good detail. Anything else about your vehicle or equipment that we may have missed that would be worth mentioning? Uh, Vehicle-wise, well, there's always people around that are going to tell you what the right vehicle is and and, uh, what the absolute setup is that you must have. But at the end of the day, it's going to be your own choices. And uh, the biggest tip I can give you is don't overplan it. Uh, Just go for it. Uh, If you start planning it and making sure that you have every contingency covered, you're going to be planning until past retirement age. Um, just go out there and start off with a couple of small trips and then generally and slowly increase them. Um, I think that's the, that's the, that's the biggest one. Um, Very good. Yeah. So we believe in giving back and doing good in the world, and that's important to us. So what are your thoughts on how either you or our listeners can do good things for others on their overland trips? Yeah, that was a thing for us as well. Uh, we wanted to help out people, and uh, we ended up doing this as well. Uh, we found out that the best way for us to do this is to uh, support small uh, local initiatives. Um, like uh, in Malawi, we supported this uh, small local primary school and, and uh, community project, and we gave them uh, a couple hundred dollars, and they were able to... to uh, vaccinate the entire school for uh, some scary African disease. I forget the name. But just with a few hundred dollars, they were able to vaccinate the entire school. That was completely amazing. That's great. Um, and we did a couple of things like that on the way. Um, one of the things that happened to us on the way is that we completely lost faith in the uh, the bigger GMOs, the, the, uh, the, the, the third world aid. Um, we found this. We met this lady on the way in, in Nairobi, and she worked for USAID, which I think is one of the biggest ones out there. And uh, she told us that her job was to find project that, uh, projects that projects that have succeeded. So I asked her, you know, what's your area? What's what? What's which countries do you do this in? And she said, well, all of Africa. Okay. And how long have you been doing this? She said, well, four years. Okay. And you know, I'm always a bit cynical, so I told, asked her. 
well, did you find any yet, any projects, any third world project that have succeeded? And she said, no. And I was completely blown away. That's wild. So it is wild because, uh, well, we can, uh, we can go into this for hours, so I don't think that's the <laughs> general goal here. But, you know, that worked for whatever, you know, just to sum up, what, what worked for us was to, just to support the local initiatives. That way you find out, that, that you make sure that your money goes where it's supposed to be going and there's no overhead and it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't support the local government's new Mercedes collection. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't take a lot to do the entire school. I mean, exactly. Um, and one of the things we found out is that uh, there's so many companies out there uh, that want to help Africa by building a school or building an, uh, an operating theater or a hospital or whatever. And we found a couple of places that said, well, please don't. Um, we have so much, so many companies that want to build schools for us, but we don't get money to put teachers in them or to buy books for the children. So instead of building us a school, give us money for teachers or give us books or uh, help us out with the vaccination or help us out with lunch money for the children. So that's the way you can easily help those people. And that really works. There you go. Great advice. So let's wrap things up with some fun little facts. Any hobbies or other things that you do on the road other than driving and relaxing? <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> uh, no, when we're out there, we, we really go out there just to take it slow. So, you know, we grab a book or an ebook and we relax and we, we take our time and we enjoy nature and, and, and whatever happens around you. And we go for a hike every now and then, or we go by, or we even take the bicycles out into the bush. And that was kind of fun. But, uh, yeah, photography turns out to be a bit of a hobby. And when you're out there, bird watching becomes a hobby because there's just so many out there. But, uh, no, we just took it too slow to pick up a hobby. There you go. Do you uh, or your wife play any musical instruments or sing on the road or around the campfire at night? Yeah, I was thinking about bringing my guitar, but then I figured I'd just chase away the wildlife or the locals because I just don't play good enough. <laughs> What is your favorite morning drink in the when you uh, get up and you're getting ready to go? No, well, that's that that'd be coffee and whiskey in in no particular order. Very um, good. And at night, any favorite <laughs> drinks after a long day on the road? Coffee and whiskey yeah. again? There you go. <laughs> No, I usually uh, just just start up in the morning with coffee, and uh, after sunset, you know, grab a beer or a whiskey. Um, but the thing is, you know, my wife really likes to have a, a glass of wine, um, and sometimes it's really difficult just to find, you know, wine that's even vaguely drinkable. Uh, so I was really, you know, lucky just to be able to grab a beer because you can get a beer anywhere. Good. What is your best advice to aspiring overlanders like us? Stop planning and go and keep going. You know, challenge yourself and go to another continent and learn new languages and new customs and meet new people. And, you know, find out um, that even though you can't speak a word of each other's language, you can still communicate. And, you know, you have many of the same interests. Uh, realize that the most of the cost of traveling is in your fuel. So slow down. The slower you travel, the cheaper it becomes. Um, outside of North America, stay away from national parks. In, in Africa and Asia, uh, the local wildlife is also outside the parks. And in, 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 for instance, in Africa, if you pay the, the national parks, it does little for the local people. So find a village just outside the park and enjoy it from a different perspective. We had like uh, elephants and hippos and crocodiles walk or slither uh, by our car. And most of the time that was outside national parks. So, yeah, that would be my most important tips. Very good. And how can people learn more about you? Uh, they can go to our website, uh, which I'm hoping you're going to link to uh, somehow because it's uh, www.tenhope.net. Yep, we'll put it in our show notes. <laughs> All right, thanks. And any business or organization you'd like to mention that our listeners should check out? Um, yeah, there's a few. Uh, a few. Uh, Mr. Funnel, I think, is a, a great little gadget for uh, cleaning your fuel while you're gassing up. 
It's a, it's an, an active funnel that you put in your gas filler, and then you start filling up, and then you see whether the fuel is clean or not, which is really neat uh, outside of the uh, civilized countries. Um, another one is horizonsunlimited.com. Uh, they got this forum. It's uh, originally built for motorcycle uh, adventures, but there's also a 4x4 overland section, and it's a great source of information for navigation, for waypoints, for country information, for sharing guides uh, in China or whatever. Um, and if you go to Facebook, there's the group called Overland Sphere, which is also a great source of information. And they often refer to a website called overlandingassociation.org. And that's an amazing source for finding out what visa you need or what kind of uh, documents you need or uh, whatever. Uh, and that's worldwide, so you can get all kinds of information on that as well. Before we wrap it up, anything we missed or useful resources uh, that you haven't mentioned yet that our listeners should check out? Um, well, uh, one thing uh, about money and currency that we talked about earlier um, and just general uh, talking to officials on the way. Uh, biggest tip I can give you about of dealing with officials is to not do not bribe ever. Um, because it may be an easy way out for you at the time, but it'll make it more difficult for whoever's behind you. Um, we ended up not bribing anyone because there was hardly any reason for it. And uh, in Tanzania, they have a couple of corrupt. Uh, they have a lot of corrupt uh, police, but you know, just play dumb and don't give them anything. And after a while, they'll just let you go. There's no need for bribing, and uh, if you do, it just makes it more difficult for whoever's whoever's coming after you. Uh, Great tips. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. We are grateful and absolutely humbled that you've given us such an amazing look into your world. So safe travels and adventures to you and your wife. We hope to catch up with you down the road again sometime soon. All right. Well, thank you very much. I was completely surprised that you found this. I'm really proud that you, uh, that you had me on the show. And uh, who knows? We'll see each other on the road someday. I hope so. We would really enjoy that. Cheers. All right. Thanks. That's a wrap. What a great time with Misha. So many good stories with such amazing experience in their overland travels. From donating their generator in Uganda to funding vaccination efforts for the entire school in Malawi. What an amazing couple doing good things in the world, helping other people. Well, they're doing what they love together as a couple. We hope you enjoyed our talk with Misha, and we'll see you on the next episode of GHT Overland Podcast. Cheers. <laughs>